Hello. Hello. Look at us. On cue. On time. Welcome, everyone. How are you doing? Are you now in the pit of despair? And definitely uh, somebody uh, in the chat, Mamaso6, uh, we're recognizing Catherine O'Hara only because she's awesome, not because something awful has happened. No. Everything's fine. As far as we know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Ah, first Canadian winter. Yeah, welcome. Bienvenidos. <laughs> yeah, so uh, help help somebody out um, yeah. and uh, give lots of tips on how to stay warm. My feet are freezing and we're inside and the temperature is the same in the house as it always is. But set points. Come on, Wi-Fi, you got this. Everybody says you're really what's going on. <laughs> okay. I just um, discovered a pep talk generator with four columns of starts and finishes. Oh, did you? Yep. That's amazing. Tiger, Champ. Tiger, your presence here just shimmers for reals. <laughs> oh, dear. That's to you, Wi-Fi. You got it go. going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Folks are still coming in, so I don't want to get started, like, right, right now, because... Wi-Fi, your DNA is a rainbow factory. Amen? Is that what... Just saying, everything you have is paying off big time. That's just science. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna keep this. We're gonna print oh, this and put it on the wall. <laughs> yeah, we could. We could. Oh my goodness. That's really good. Can you make a poster out of it? Oh uh, yeah. We're yeah. definitely gonna do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I, I'm guessing the Wi-Fi is just bringing folks in a minute or two beyond what they were hoping so let's just uh let's just kind of put it on pause for a second and let let everyone in oh still coming in and to quote sarah harmer the harmer the amazing sarah harmer look 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 at your feet it's a gray area yeah okay that's how i'm living my life today okay i'll be back in a second <laughs> i know so I know. People are still coming in. Yeah, uh, but we're going to get going. Um, what have we got? 100 and nearly 200. One, two, three. Holy smokes. A bunch of you just like stormed the Bastille. Welcome. Uh, nothing bad has happened to Catherine O'Hara. We're just soliciting. So not a lot of ones and twos or fives. I myself felt like I a four, I thought initially. A nine, I thought secondarily. And then I looked deep into the eyes of number eight and I thought, yeah, today... Today's an eight. I feel like an eight. So we've got some stuff, some cool stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about, um, remember we talked about photo period last time and the role that photo period played with your flounder in your graphing of the what the flounder moment. Uh, well, we're going to pick up uh, some of the flounder um, thoughts and we're going to extend them today, this, uh, to later today. To mammals and looking at mammals in high Arctic environments. Lily is going to keep snoozing on that Antarctica inspired quilt behind. And we're going to start out talking about um, some frogs and some how you might want to freeze. Yeah, but yeah. look at that. We've got over 205. Okay. We're good to go. We're good to go. So, this is a puck. <laughs> <laughs> but this puck is actually an amphibian named Lithobates sylvaticus. Um, and I am old enough that uh, when I worked on this frog, it was called Rana sylvatica. But some scientists who ought to know that told us that it must be so, and we never, ever, ever doubted what no one is sure about. And Rana uh, is a polyphyletic group. Um, extra marks in the chat if you can identify that quote. Um, so this is a freeze tolerant frog. This is one of the most widely distributed amphibians. It is the most widely distributed amphibian in the world. Um, you probably, if you're from, I'm going to hazard a guess that say, if you're from Canada and in this course, you have wood frogs where you grew up. If you live in particular parts of Guelph, you have wood frogs where you live right now. Um, if you thought to yourself, you know, I live in a wet area and in the spring I hear a lot of ducks <laughs> and then the ducks go away, those are wood frogs. Uh, and probably in your wet area, which may even be forested uh, and just a flooded temporary area, those are wood frogs. Their call sounds like wah, 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 wah. And if you put hundreds and hundreds of them together, it sounds like uh, the ducks are coming marching one by one. One of the amazing adaptations of this amazing amphibian is their capacity 
to not freeze a void. Remember, uh, like a week ago today, I, we threw out a reference to the American toad living probably where you do, and the wood frog living probably where you do. The American toad, Bufo americanus, or Anaxorus americanus, buries itself beneath the frost line. Wood frog, they don't care. Freeze solid. <laughs> That's their strategy, which is kind of amazing. And so, in some parts of the world, not particularly here in the southern part of its uh, range, but that means that for in some parts of the world, like in Alaska, in the lower parts of uh, Nunavut or the NWT, the Northwest Territories, or the Yukon, high uh, latitude Saskatchewan, Alberta, they could spend up to 65, like 65 percent of the year, 70 percent of the year, approaching 80 percent of the year in this state. So this is like the natural state of the wood frog. If you were just to be an alien landing on the planet and kind of look down and say, what are those? Those are frog-like hockey pucks and occasionally they quack like a duck. Isn't this a crazy planet? Um, so they do this because they can keep their body, total body, it's frozen. And they move the water outside of the cells. Um, and they do that because of the, uh, the production of high concentrations of osmolites. So things like uh, sugars, like glucose, uh, glycerol, urea, and that changes, fundamentally changes the intracellular environment, and it controls where the ice forms in this frog. Now, sometimes when people look at this picture of the frozen puck, they think, yeah, exaggerating, but eh, we're not, we're not. But before we get to like an actual kind of a, um, a time lapse of a wood frog regaining life, so we've got the fact that they freeze solid, they're using glucose or derivatives of as a cryoprotectin and that their organs dehydrate. So this is a frog, this is um, both, these are both frogs, uh, amphibians taken, photographs taken near Churchill in the subarctic on the shores of Hudson Bay. And this is the header of a paper written by some uh, researchers at the university or Miami University. Miami University, if you're looking to do graduate work, is in Ohio. There are many students who arrive at Ohio at, at Miami University thinking that they, like they come in flip flops, shorts, Havana t-shirts, and then it's cold, in and they study Oxford, freeze tolerance. Ohio, Oxford, Ohio. Uh, why they call it Miami? Well, it has to do with first peoples that live there, uh, for whom that is their land. Uh, so Costanza, Lee, and Loritz did a lot of this work. But if you're really interested in this. Uh, you probably want to go to Carleton University uh, to do your graduate work where you can work with the stories, uh, Ken and Karen story, who are researchers at Carleton University and have done a lot of the work of clarifying how we understand these physiological responses. Now, the picture on the left is how you picture wood frogs. Picture on the right is an egg mass. One of the cool things about wood frogs that's also associated with heat is that they lay their eggs communally. So you don't find generally just one like this. You find hundreds of eggs, hundreds of egg masses, each containing hundreds of eggs. So thousands, tens of thousands of tadpoles all in one space. And the thought is that that's because they're using the uh, jelly matrix there to help warm those eggs that are in the center. Hockey puck, you say. Don't believe it. Well, let's watch. In this amazing video, you can see a frog frozen solid at negative 3 degrees Celsius. It has no sign of life. No heartbeat, no breathing, no observable brain activity. It's like me. As the animal gradually warms, life returns. As if nothing has happened, he's ready to breed and create the next generation of frozen frogs. Now that actually How do they do it? Well, the frog pulls water away from its vital organs well, actually... and lets it freeze in the in-between spaces. Imagine if we could do this, this suspend our lives and lose all signs of Stranger life, things? then spring back when times are good. Though we know how it manages to avoid freezing damage, much of this amazing feat remains a mystery and may well for quite some time. 
Now, one of the cool things to me about the end of that video, and I and I encourage you to watch it later on because I'm imagining with um, the Wi-Fi being as good as it is, it maybe was jumpy for you. It's actually jumpy for us here in the in the house. Yeah. But one of the cool things about it is the spasmodic way. Once so life heartbeat returns and then eventually some larger muscles on the extremities return. And I've seen that because I work with amphibians. And part of when I worked with amphibians uh, as a young person and I had uh, hair and I went to Trenton University in Peterborough, Ontario, I was looking at collecting, uh, looking at phys the physiological ecology of amphibians in Ontario and how well they repair damage to ultra uh, to their DNA that's caused by ultraviolet radiation, blah, blah, blah. To do that, I needed a lot of tissue and I didn't really want to go around pithing amphibians. And so I decided that a, a good way to harvest the tissue that I needed was to go hang out at Rhodes because as probably many, most or all of you know, in the spring, there's large mortality of amphibians as they come out on wet, warm nights and they move across roads and cars also use the roads and then the amphibians yield to the cars by going <laughs> underneath the tires. And so I would go out and I would harvest kind of the amphibians off the road and you identify them to species and then use those tissues for the assays I needed to do. Lovely. Uh, and better than pithing, in my opinion. So what that meant, though, was that I would go out and how exactly this pertains to freeze tolerance. I would go out and I, I had made a particularly large pile of wood frogs one night. And I decided the next day I was gonna work with the blue spotted salamander pile. So I collected the wood frogs that had all been killed by the car on the road. And I put them in a yogurt container. And I put the yogurt container in the freezer in the lab. And the next day I worked on the blue spotted salamanders. Two days, a week later, I came back and I decided today is a wood frog day. So I took the wood frogs out of the freezer and I put them on the bench to uh, dry, uh, to warm up and separate so that I could uh, identify the tissues that I wanted and dissect them out. A friend of mine came in later and said, what are you doing? This looks pretty macabre. And I said, Dave, it is pretty macabre, but blah, 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 blah. And he said, yeah, cool. Why is that one moving? And I was like, oh, oh, oh you're pretty funny. And then just like in that spasmodic kind of bias towards one side uh, rowing action that you saw as that amphibian came back to life, one of the wood frogs, which had been hit by a car, and had been refrozen after spending the entirety of the Peterborough winter frozen, um, was returning to life. This is kind of an amazing thing. And we kept it around uh, for a few days. He might not have been the smartest of all of the wood frogs, <laughs> but we figured that he was probably possessing genes and a suite of genetic characteristics that needed to go to be maintained in the uh, in the population going forward. Potentially the ability to be refrozen and also the ability to dealing well with cars. So if you or your family lives in the Peterborough area and eventually down the line there are um, wood frogs that seem to be going out and threatening cars and not being res <laughs> not responding to being compacted by cars or potentially wood frogs that can deal with um, the intermittent freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw that happens or is anticipated to happen in lots of the world with climate with the climate crisis. This may be because of this male frog that we released back into the population to meet the ladies and to pass on these uh, genetic markers. So we go from what the flounder to what, what the frog? The frog. <laughs> and a couple of observations about frogs in the in the chat. Ponds are full of edges. Yeah, there's exactly they lay. That's it's exactly around the edges. Often on things like um, dogwood branches that uh, reach over and are kind of submerged on the lower part. They love those those sunny bits of the edge. Those heat up fast, and then the egg masses all together heat up even more. And um, I was always calling those leopard frogs. Leopard frogs have spots. Wood the wood frog has a mask on its face and like a black area around its eyes. Their, sound, their call is like, wah, 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 wah. but the leopard frog is like a squeaky door. It's like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> ask me why that's a squeaky door. That's a different lecture. <laughs> okay, so um, some really important things um, to think about when we think about being able to tolerate freezing, right? It's controlled, yeah. right? Physiologically, really, really specially controlled. So we're not just taking a frog and throwing it in the freezer. Um, there are certain parts of the frog that are not really frozen-ish and other parts that are. And it has to do with this physiological control of where the freezing or where these ice crystals are forming, okay? So you can't just like, like they do with some people 
put them in the freezer and hope to reanimate them because there's a lot of cellular and tissue damage that's done as a result of the formation of the ice crystals. When you freeze Walt Disney, then he, you thaw him out, he's still dead again. <laughs> it won't work, that's it gross. never will. <laughs> Walt Disney's gone. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> Walt Disney froze himself. Yeah. Um, He had others do it. Yeah. So we can't do that yet. Now, um, there are some interesting applications and things that we can learn from freezing. Yeah. Um, So so this type of technology or this, you know, the studies of the ability to freeze tissue and then reanimate is really important when we talk about things like organ transplants, right? Where you're going to do it for a, a short period of time to minimize damage, but also be able to increase the lifespan of these organs as they travel, you know, from one place to another with somebody holding on to like a little a little box. Um, So so, yeah, so we're not talking about, you know, being able to transfer the entire technology over or the entire adaptation, but there are definitely interesting things that can be learned from it that can be applied. And the other thing to think about, I made reference kind of in a half hour away to the climate crisis, talking about the, the, our observation of that frozen, melted frozen frog, is that metabolically, metabolically preparing for freezing is a, is a challenging process. It's kind of like outside of reproduction. It's the majority of what that frog is trying to do throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of the odd things about this is that it could, at the end of the winter, go through this process again. And, and one of the predicted uh, occurrences in the climate crisis is less snow cover, deeper freeze, and freeze, rethaw, the increase in kind of freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, events that's going to be metabolically very costly to the animals that are freeze tolerant and it's going to be very damaging to the animals that are burying themselves and trying to avoid because without snow cover that freeze is going to get deeper into the ground what is this jewelry technology that you're wearing here on that was arm? something uh, that we used in the 90s called a watch <laughs> all it did was tell the time it was like a, it was like a was single it. function tool yep, yep. wow yeah um wonderful so what the flounder what the oh, frog how do you tell male frogs from female frogs um and someone else has observed that females are definitely diff- uh, typically larger this is true because they have to store hundreds thousands of eggs so females are often larger males often have big thumbs um and to hold on to females uh, while they're mating and in the breeding season a male frog will have like a, a darker throat uh, and that's because of the vascularization of their calling or their vocal pouch that often has to enlarge as they do these kind of big calls. Yep. If you think about um, next time you see a bullfrog, the males will have a very dark yellow throat. Okay. Cool. And big thumbs. And big thumbs. <laughs> They're like enthusiastic. You ready? Good to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So winter flounder, remember? Why don't the fish freeze? And wood frogs both experience sub-zero temperatures, okay? So they both go into very, very cold temperatures, but their tissues respond differently. Their bodies respond differently. One is a freeze avoider, and the other is a freeze tolerator. Okay. And this is, this is again, like my whole thing about, you know, look at what's on the axes, look at what you, you know, think about what you can assume and what you can't, the information that's actually there and the information that might be inferred. Okay. So just kind of try to really differentiate and what you can do to kind of practice is to just put stuff on axes and see what you get, right? See if you can tell the difference between a freeze tolerator and a freeze avoider with those different variables that you're playing around with. So we could then push it a little bit, right? So here I said graph them, right? Are there any freeze tolerant endotherms? Because we've only really been talking about ectotherms. Do all endotherms attempt to regulate a constant high body temperature at all times in the cold? And how do endotherms deal with extreme cold? Does it depend on time scale of exposure and how? And so these are the questions that we can transfer from the things that we've learned about ectotherms and apply them now 
to endotherms and you know the answer may be no to some of these things um it's largely no but um but you know the no then leads to okay well why not or what did they do um in a way that becomes really interesting and teaches you then a whole bunch of totally different physiology because what we end up with like endothermy and ectothermy kind of they set a context within which evolution, you know, takes place, right? So evolution, we've always been saying that evolution happens within a context. And we usually, what we've been talking about before is the context of ecology. But there's also just the context of like, of the body, of like the thing that evolution is operating on and the internal ecology or the internal environment. Um, and so, you know, you can't, you, you, you know, evolution very rarely makes things from scratch. And so they're, you know, it's always kind of co-opting little pieces of things that are already there, right? Kind of tinkering more than, you know, inventing from new. Um, and there's some beautiful and, and kind of obvious and uh, examples of that, like um, the, the bones that you have in your ear um, that help you hear, right? Those little tiny bones. Those originally come from the jaw um, when, you know, back when we were fish and other things. Like the 70s. <laughs> like the 70s, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the jaw was, was a, a multi-bone um, uh, structure, right? Um, and then these pieces got kind of co-opted over time through adaptation and natural selection and everything that you know to be something else that's super useful. Um, so, so, you know, without those bones there, uh, hearing would be probably very different or maybe not at all. So, um, so it's really kind of cool to think about the, the sort of the internal context of the body and with endothermy and ectothermy, those are kind of big rules. Those are like big contexts, um, that really do sort of direct and can limit the types of adaptations that evolve. Do you know the song, song Frogs in a Blender? I do not know the song uh, Flog, Frogs in a Blender. We're going to we're gonna have to look it up later on. Yeah. Ooh, let's not. Okay. So just a quick little check, if you don't mind. Grab any stamp you want. Um, behavioral avoidance. So is that a freeze tolerant or a freeze intolerant strategy? Super. Okay. Production of antifreeze compounds. Is that freeze intolerant or freeze tolerant? Synthesis of ice nucleating agents. Freeze tolerant or freeze avoidance? Super cooling. Intemperate and not Arctic species. Free, intolerant or tolerant. Wonderful, thank you. This is, this is so good just to get your feedback on where you are with all of this. So uh, free uh, behavioral avoidance, freeze intolerant, totally. Uh, production of antifreeze compounds. So that would be freeze intolerant. Push your stamps over to the freeze intolerant area. Go, 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 there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not freeze tolerant because it is avoiding freezing. It is anti-freeze, right? Good. Synthesis of ice nucleating agents is a freeze tolerant strategy because it controls where the freezing is going to happen. So that's really good. Supercooling in temperate, not Arctic species uh, is a freeze intolerant approach because it's super cooling which means it's not freezing but it's just lowering that kind of freeze point that set point of whatever tissue it is okay any questions just pop them in the chat okay cool so we talked about this already um and i just kind of want to revisit it um mostly because i think it's just freaking cool yeah um this whole idea about why photo period would evolve instead of uh temperature as a trigger for a lot of these physiological adaptations right so the wood frog for example 
it doesn't, do we know what the trigger is for sure, for sure? It'll be photo period. It'll be photo period. Like nine times out of 10, it's going to be photo period and not temperature that's going to trigger uh, all of these adaptations, right? This prepper, this physiological preparation for freezing. Uh, it's It's got to be photo period, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, lots of things use photo period. Um, at not all things, but lots of things do use it as a, as a means of queuing up like seasonal adaptations or seasonal body changes. Uh, birds use it um, also. Yeah, all sorts of species use photo period. And we talked about it before. Um, the reason might be because it is more stable, more predictable, more reliable. But what we want to consider is the decoupling of that stability and that reliability. What happens when photo period is no longer a reliable predictor of temperatures? <laughs> Evan, you're making us laugh. <laughs> okay. Oh, and Sam's getting involved too. Okay. So <laughs> I think the other thing to remember about the photo period in the last, we, we didn't really talk about it explicitly, but when we talked about the flounder example, where photo period, that's underwater. That that's in a in an environment that is uh, covered in ice. It's it, it's the it it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's bananas. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're just gonna Where wait. Where are we going? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Maya, good. Go. Just just we'll take a minute. And... <laughs> yeah. No, I kind of looked at. I didn't think those were thumbs. I thought he had a knife. I was like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We do have time in this class to kind of like be silly, so it's fine. Um, but I actually, I am kind of excited because I think you're going to like what we're going to talk about next. So, 10 more seconds. You take a screen grab. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Okay. And we're moving on. That's funny. <laughs> you got a screen grab? Yeah. Good. Clear. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, this decoupling, what happens in the climate crisis? Um, in the context of the climate crisis, decoupling might actually happen. So why don't you just for a second think about what you might predict could happen. You can be specific or general. Uh, throw them in the chat. Um, what might happen then if a whole bunch of physiological triggers are connected to photo period in the context of the climate crisis. Go. Somebody made the observation that that thing had thumbs, so it was a male frog. <laughs> <Not a light bulb. laughs> That's very good. And green 12. Okay, so what might we predict? <laughs> Physiological decoupling of triggers and adaptation. So think about. Um, as you're in your experience in the world as a biologist, as a as a person learning biology, as a person just sharing the planet with all these other taxa around the world, what kind of decouplings might you see? Shifts in things. Give me some examples of some things. Here they start to come in. That's good. So animals preparing for freezing but don't actually freeze. Yep. Uh, temperatures will not be consistent with the daylight, with the, with the photo period. That's also true. And so think about then, um, yeah, so, okay, so think about, expand to think about these consequences to what you're observing. Waking up too early, too late in the year. With that in as an example, what kind of consequences for different taxa might that, um, might happen there? Waking up too early, too late in the year for a, um, yeah, death. Right. So I think about decoupling of, of herbivores and their uh, and their host plants. Uh, if one of them is is coming out uh, too late or too early, if maybe if the caterpillar is is emerging before the leaves do, you can imagine that that's problematic. Uh, might get frozen when not prepared for it. Missing the breeding season. Uh, seasons no longer remaining stable. Frogs yes. freeze uh, and die. Yeah. Animals changing fur colors too early, becoming targets for predators. Prey emergence may occur at different times, could impact many, many other species. And they thought about specifically aquatic invertebrates. That's really important. Wonderful. Now, the prey, the fur color is interesting. T. Martiner, uh, extinction, 
yeah, if a lot of these things, certainly local or extirpation, mm -hmm. uh, since a lot of these northern species have quite l large ranges, but you could imagine that in some parts of it, they uh, they could no longer live there. So we'd call that local extinction or extirpation. Yep. Super. That, that's great. Yeah, disrupted like, fantastic migration. list. Yeah. Yeah. I we talked it. about some of these back in like the first or the second. Um, back in the 70s? Back in the 70s, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think last week when we kind of entered physiology. Or was yeah. it the week before? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, anyhow. There's yeah. some examples back there that you can kind of revisit. But we're going to dive into one because it's actually one that you came up with. T. Martiner, animals changing fur color. Uh, animals Bunnies. with the fur color. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm getting really into uh, hair and rabbits um, with my PhD. They're delicious. They're yummy. Well, yes, <laughs> um, but um, my PhD student um, Pauline is uh, studying um, Eastern cottontail. <coughs> Are you okay? I'm. Yes, that was quite early, but you think I'm on an edge. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Maybe you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so my my PhD student, Pauline, um, is studying Eastern Cottontail rabbits, and we're doing a, a whole sort of One Health approach to Eastern Cottontail wildlife rehabilitation. And so I am learning so much about rabbits. Um, and I had a huge heartbreak this summer. Um, Come when... here, Doug. Doug. No, it wasn't Doug. It was That's a skunk. True. A skunk killed the bunny nest that I was trying to. Anyway, it was awful, and there was carnage everywhere. But this is an Arctic hare, um, and they're amazing, and they're huge. Yeah, like bigger than Lily. Much bigger. Than Much Lily. bigger than Lily. Like they would kick the crap out of Lily. Yes. Um, and actually, I nearly lost my shit one time in the Arctic when um, we were sitting in a tent that had no windows, mm -hmm. and we heard like pulling, like like something was playing on the guide wires of the of the tent. It was one of those like big weather havens, right? Really nice, comfy, warm. Anyway, we were sitting in this, and it was like I don't know, two in the morning totally bright outside um and we heard like some something was like pinging and we both looked at it this is my friend roger uh who i just met for the first time in like 20 years right the last time i saw roger was this story and then a few weeks ago when we were in the arctic uh like a couple months ago now he was there and he looked at me and he was like 2001 <laughs> Like, yeah. And he said, okay. you left me. You left me. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Roger and I are sitting there and I think we were just having a little bit of scotch before bed or something like this. And then this like ping, ping, ping. And we thought it was a polar bear. We like, oh my goodness, the both of us. And like, you know how that whole like, oh, let's go into this door and see what's behind it. And that's when like, you know, the clown jumps out and like, ah, ah, kind of deal. Well, this is what we were thinking was going to happen with the polar bear. That was it a might've... combination of Norman Bates and Pennywise the Clown. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It might have it might have been like the scotch, but <laughs> so anyway, so we did. We unzipped, and I don't remember who it was. I'm gonna guess it was Roger. We unzipped the Weather Haven and we poked our head out, and there was this totally snow white Arctic hare. Okay. And this is the segue. It was snow white. It was not this color. So, very, very cool things going on with Arctic hair and their fur color adaptation, okay? So this is a photo of an Arctic hair taken in the summer um, in the Arctic, and you can tell by the plants that are around. Um, so obviously these are flowering, so it's the summer months. Um, and or, or weeks. Or weeks, yeah. Um, and they're very tall, so it's a southern Arctic um, photo image of an Arctic hair. Um, but... In the winter, um, this is what they look like, and they're adorable and fuzzy and soft and cute, um, and uh, very well camouflaged, right, in the background. Um, and uh, even these little black spots, they disrupt. They look like, you know, some of the some of the um, uh, the rocks and things like this. So it's it's totally cool. They're really really well camouflaged, uh, except. Um, there's some interesting things going on with the seasonality and the changes. 
Yeah. So this is looking at across um, in the Yukon. So kind high boreal subarctic kind of anim animals um, in this particular species and looking at different uh, measurements of the coat, including the length of the guard hair, the length of the, the, the density of both guard hairs, which are what's changing, and then the downy coat, so the underlying kind of dense coat that's keeping them warm. And what they're finding, what these researchers found, was the change in that you would expect in between fall and winter, that the coat gets both more dense and the guard hairs get longer. Uh, the length of the downy hair is one that doesn't change, but then everything else is kind of increasing and, and um, kind of getting ready for winter. And these are changes associated with that change in coat color. The coat color that, as Dr. Jacobs mentioned, becomes allows the the hair to remain cryptic because even though they're quite fast shared amongst uh, across kind of different genera or different different species of, of rabbit is the idea that yeah running we're pretty good at it but really our first defense towards perceived predation is to not move because energetically it's probably going to work more times than not and so being cryptic uh, having the same color, a color that bends, blends into the background, is really, really important. So, the white guard hair is actually help um, with the with the the insulation as well. But there's some differences. There's some super interesting differences. And these 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 predate the the climate crisis. So yeah. what, you're, what we're going to show you here in a second. It's just natural biology, right? Yeah. Okay. So on the left hand side. You have an adorable Arctic hare from Churchill, Manitoba, which so sub -Arctic. is subarctic, exactly. And over here, you have an adorable Arctic hare in the summer from very close to where Roger and I were hanging out drinking scotch in a weather haven. Um, and summer, summer, they could have been taken in the same weeks. So why is the one on the right still white? what might explain these differences there are many many hypotheses so basically <laughs> yes it might <laughs> nicole's like this one's beautiful okay this one's adorable too so what is going on why then might we notice and this is a thing so high high arctic hair don't change color over the summer. Low Arctic hair or mid do. Like the the graphs in yeah. the previous. And slide. this is like pre climate crisis. Yeah. This is like this is like traditional ecological knowledge. What's going on with these two observations? Observation uh, hypothesis that changes are temperature dependent. None of it has really small light season, long dark season. Is it because summers are shorter? Uh, there is still snow on the ground in none of it, so so they can still blend in. Yep, yeah. it's good. Could still be snow in none of it in the summertime. Snow <laughs> melts later in the season. <laughs> actually do that okay are they the same the, yeah. hair species good question yes yep. for now yeah, yeah there we go I'm Sim Dav. summers are shorter so not worth the energy needed to change coat color yeah really good so building on all of those like smaller hypotheses yes all of those things yes yeah, summers are shorter energetically there's a cost to changing your coat color now they do have a summer coat uh the ones that stay white throughout the the summer they do have a lighter coat um but they don't change the color right so um so yeah all of these things are accurate and yes some parts of the arctic have snow during some parts the of the yeah. arctic do um but like this snow patch here is is certainly going to melt before the end of the summer but the summer is like only a few weeks long right um, and so, yeah, so there's kind of like a, there's a trade-off, right? Physiologically between the energy associated with an adaptation that's helpful versus the cost associated with doing that for a very short time. 
okay? And it's just not worth it. And even the just north. their capacity physiologically to do it yeah. fast enough. So, so there's the cost of doing it. And then also, well, if they're going to invest in it, how long will it take? <laughs> okay, cool. Kind of neat, right? So this is like a totally normal, natural thing. Um, and here, more or less, is the line, right, below which you're going to have these seasonal changes in, um, in coat, uh, above which you're not going to have these seasonal changes, okay? And now, right, so we're not just talking about seasonal changes, we're talking about differences too, and now let's layer on the complexity of the climate crisis um, and think a little bit about what's going to happen. Before we get there, this is just a, a shout out to the fact that we know about the Arctic hare. It's often as a thing that, that we live beside or near or have been exposed to. You can see it's one of about nine plus examples, nearly a dozen examples of different mammal species that do this. So the snowshoe hare, the Arctic hare. Um, but did you know that there is a Siberian hamster? I did not. It's coat color. Okay, can we can we just like for a second because we do Google have what the we, yeah hamsters. we're gonna Google Siberian hamster because that's gonna be adorable. <laughs> and of course the other foxes as well. <laughs> okay, wait. Yeah. Let's share. <laughs> there, there's a Siberian hamster. Oh my goodness, there's a Syrian hamster. Oh, yeah. We have to learn about hamsters. I said no one ever. <laughs> look, look, it's so cute. <laughs> and this is like winter coat and this is summer coat. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Look at that. That's adorable. Now, my guess is this is one of those cases. See how with the both two of the bottom right examples yeah. uh, in the bottom row and the example of the whitetail jackrabbit and the Siberian hamster, <laughs> these all, <clears throat> and I guess the weasel as well the long-tailed weasel a lot of these examples are these uh are outside of polar regions what's mm -hmm. going on there well these are mostly high elevation taxa mm -hmm. so it's another case where the the conditions involving um at, at high elevation are mimicking what we see uh ecologically in high latitudes can one of you please do your phd on the siberian hamster and then come back to us like you know 15 years yes, from lecture. now yeah. and like lecture in this class because that would blow my mind we'll still be here <laughs> um, amazing and you're hopefully um gonna see some collared lemmings uh coming up in some of the course link stuff we did some videos in Ikaluptuktiak uh this uh summer there was one called uh i think her name was George, um, who was really friendly and really happy just to come out and like be seen and video uh, videotaped. So I think we're going to be able to work that stuff in. If you haven't already seen it, it should be coming up. Did you just say videotaped? We totally did. What should I have said? What it what recorded? Recorded? Videoed? Videoed? The tape. The tape part was like, yeah, the elder millennial. Okay. <laughs> Um, You're a very young Gen X. I'm a very young Gen X. Oh, I'm right on the border. Yeah, okay. you can you can self-identify across. You, yeah. You live on okay. It. Now these types of uh, the cues associated with um, with um, tr you know tr uh, these adaptations for the seasons have been known for a while. So here's like a quotation from 1942, which predates both of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the whole idea is the cyclical wave of growth is known to occur annually or biannually and the Arctic hare is definitely seasonal in its incidence being associated with seasonal alteration in the period of daylight. So photo period has been known to be the trigger for, for a while, um, which is kind of super concerning, right? Um, because we can think now, let's think specifically about what some of the consequences are, uh, to the Arctic hare, or if you want, go back to the flounder. If you're like a fish person, we have this photo period. We have the adaptation of the, uh, increase in antifreeze proteins for the winter flounder. We have the adaptation of the change in the fur color for the rabbit, uh, for the hare. So in the context of the climate crisis, right, where there's going to be a decoupling of the, the proxy of photo period for environmental temperature, let's be very specific now. 
what might you predict would happen to the winter flounder and what might you predict would happen to the Arctic hare? Put it in that white space, put it in the chat. Anywhere. Yeah, it's starting to appear. So the coat color will no longer match its surroundings and will get eaten more, more exposed to predation. Good. Uh, the hair might become too warm and also overexposed to predators. Okay. Fur coat will not survive, serve designated purpose. Excellent. Yeah. Good. So this comes back. So good. And, and keep on writing them. Yep. Play around with the flounder too. Um, oh, I thought those were for the flounder. And their fur coat. <laughs> they were for the fur. What ah. the fur? Um, Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so remember this whole thing about, you know, context, ecological context for the selection of different adaptations or different mutations and different things, right? So climate change, uh, climate crisis is kind of messing around with the context, right? Um, and it's not necessarily that everything's just going to like die on the tundra um, uh, immediately. There is the opportunity or the possibility for selection and for mutation and all of those things, right? It's just a question of, of the pace. If it happens really quickly versus a little bit more slowly. And again, that totally depends on what species we're talking about, right? Um, the pace of the climate crisis for bacterial populations is probably okay for the selection of new adaptations. Maybe not so much for things that take a little bit longer to, you know, go through a generation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, all sorts of different, you know, possibilities that are going to happen with this, with this decoupling. Antifreeze proteins produced, but not necessary energy expenditure. Thank you for that piece of brilliance. Mm -hmm. Very good, right? So one of them for on the right hand side for a rabbit may actually increase predation. The winter flounder may be struggling more with the idea of expending useless energy. So that may not be as immediately serious as the white rabbit on the dark background, right? Cool. Good. I love it. Context matters. It depends, right? And this is a terrible Gosh, shot. That's a bad yeah, graph. sorry about that. But don't, if you click it when you get the PDF, it'll take you to that uh, to this this particular paper uh, from the proceedings in the National Academy that looked at uh, I think it was Arctic hare or or the the Alpine one mm -hmm. um, and looked at camouflage mismatch seasonal coat color due to decreased uh, or associated with decreased snow durations. That's right. And you may be thinking. Um, Smith, Jacobs, um, what can I do my PhD on that hasn't already been done on the Siberian hamster? Please, somebody go and study the Siberian hamster. <laughs> um, there's a lot, especially in the context of the climate crisis, right? So things are changing. These things were documented. They are, they're, you know, that's kind of all sorts of hypotheses have come from these things, but like there's so much still to do on these populations, on this decoupling, uh, and on the Siberian hamster. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so what are the limitations basically? You know, how far can we push this? What might happen to the Siberian hamster? <laughs> Oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm obsessed now. Um, uh, what might happen? Let it go, let it go. <laughs> what might happen to all of these things? Um, why are they different um, for ectotherms and endotherms and all of these kind of whatevers? We're going to dive into it. We're going to dive into some of the, the, the thinking that you might be able to apply to polar bears too to answer these questions. Um, and uh, hopefully in the next, you know, in the next, well, until the end, we're going to really tie in ecology and evolution into physiology, right? So use what we know about physiology to make predictions about the ecology and the evolution. Oh, hell, we're going to keep, we're going to, there's going to be phylogenies next week. Amazing. It's kind of, it's like all the stuff. So fun, right? 
Okay. Oh, and then it, <laughs> this is just fun. Yeah. Don't you just want a thermo like a? <laughs> I do. Yeah. So do I. I really want to put one at the house and find out where all the leaks are of the heat. I know. I was thinking about pointing them at animals, but yeah. I would be a contractor if I wasn't a professor. Okay. So, um, uh, you ever see that show? What show? I gotta go. On you gotta go. Yeah. Okay. Um, night on. Madigan, I need to know what show, what show. Okay, um, you finished writing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so even within the endotherms, there are differences, right? Take a look at the polar bear, take a look at the elephant. These are temperatures of the skin. Um, these are obvious adaptations to living in their environment, one very hot and one very cold. Um, and so even then, like, we can't just apply these, like, um, oh, the show Night on Earth? No, I haven't seen it, but now I will. Um, uh, so anyway, um, really important to understand the biology and the context when we're going to be making these predictions about what's going to happen, right? Um, and one of them is probably not going to be so bad for a little while, and another may have some more immediate physiological challenges, right? Cool. Okay. Homework. We've kind of already done this, but see if you can make it super, super clear. Um, ecological, physiological, and evolutionary perspective. Think of one potential consequence for each, um, what's the topic? Anyway, oh, for each topic, like ecology, physiology, and evolution. Um, so one statement about how uh, the climate crisis is going to affect the hairs ecologically, one physiologically, and one evolutionarily. Um, and hopefully um, you'll be able to come up with that. We'll throw some at you uh, on Monday um, and with, you know, just one of those multiple choice questions. Uh, and we will see you next time. Have a wonderful weekend.